Okay. So I'd like to welcome you, um, welcome you all again to another edition of the Quantum Fluids and Isolation Seminar. So today we have Professor Ming Cheng from Yale University who will be speaking. Professor Cheng got his Bachelor of Science from Nanjing University in 2008. He got his PhD from the University of Maryland in 2013, where he worked with Sankar Dasama. Then he got his po he started his first postdoc in 2013 at Microsoft uh, Station Q, which he completed in 2016. And then uh, from 2016 to 2017, he was a postdoc at Yale, Yale, Yale University, and now he's professor at Yale University. So please help me in welcoming either virtually or by um, unmuting yourselves briefly, Professor Ming Shan. Hey, thanks Joshua for the introduction and it's a great pleasure to uh, speak in this series of seminars. So today I will be telling you about uh, fractionalization in topological spin liquids. So uh, you might notice that I change one word in the title just to better reflect the, the content, content of my talk. Um, okay, so let me first acknowledge my uh, collaborators. So, oops. so this work is done in collaboration with uh, these gentlemen. So Yan Chen Wang and Ziyang Meng, these are uh, experts in numerical simulations, which is uh, the second part of the talk is based on. And then uh, the, the theory part is, uh, is based on the work done in collaboration with Yang Qi and also William Wechat Krempa. Okay, so here are the references of the two work. The reference of two work, uh, one is uh, a little bit older, not so recent, and the other one we posted uh, two months ago on Archive. Okay, so uh, here's an outline of the talk. So I'll start with the introduction to the concept of Z2 spin liquids and associated symmetry fractionalization. And then I'll discuss how one can classify uh, these symmetric Z2 spin liquids on a given lattice. And then I'll turn to a discussion about uh, how one can experimentally observe a uh, signature of fractionalization from conductivity, from longitudinal conductivity uh, at, at a topological phase transition between a spin liquid and also an, and a, a symmetry breaking phase. So I plan to also discuss a spectroscopic signature of a different kind of fractionalization, a fractional crystal momentum, but I figure that there won't be enough time for this, but I'll be happy to talk about this offline. And uh, by the way, so uh, feel free to interrupt me if you have any questions or you find anything unclear. Okay, all right, so quantum spin liquids. Well, what is a quantum spin liquid? So a zeroth order definition is basically it's a it's a magnetic system, meaning that you know the active degrees of freedom are local moments that nevertheless do not order at, down to zero temperature. Okay, uh, I'll say more about uh, what what these things actually are later, but uh, for now this is just a phenomenological definition. And to give you some uh, material motivation, while well, the list of possible spin liquid materials, no, candidates materials, uh, are, are still growing. So here are a few famous ones. Uh, the first picture is organic salt, uh, kappa ET, commonly referred to as kappa ET. Uh, the second one is uh, the, probably the most um, well-known spin liquid candy material. It's a mineral called Herbert Smithside. And the last one is uh, alpha rosidium chloride. Uh, which is a different kind of material with strong spin orbit coupling, etc. It's a key type material. And then also uh, put a name of you know, some relate, some similar materials. So if you want to know about the progress at the experimental front, uh, there's a nice review uh, on science this year, summarizing the status of uh, this field. But I'm a theorist, so uh, I'm more interested in understanding this phase of matter. So when we have, say, a quantum spin liquid, well, I only give you a very rough definition, a phenomenological definition. So, so the, the, the first thing we want to do is probably to understand its universal properties of this quantum phase of matter. Uh, for example, we, we would like to maybe have a low energy effective field theory that captures its long wavelengths uh, 
low energy properties. And maybe we also want to characterize and classify similar faces. Okay. And the other thing that one wants to think about is maybe we want to also understand what are the proximate phases that are separated from the spin liquid through, say, a continuous phase transitions. So we have an idea um, about how to place this particular phase on a kind of global phase diagram. Okay. And eventually, these should be uh, related to experimental observables. So maybe you want to find ways to detect uh, universal properties so that we can identify what kind of spin liquid we have. Okay. All right, so this is sort of uh, a, a grand plan of how to go about understanding these uh, exotic faces. But now let me be a little more concrete. So the kind of system that we want to think about is say a lattice of interrupting spin one halves. So these are the smallest spins. So we believe they have the strongest quantum fluctuations to maximize our chance of finding a highly quant entangled quantum state. And I won't be uh, specific about, I won't be specifying a Hamiltonian for, at least for the moment, but let's just think, let's just imagine there is a, a Hamiltonian with local interactions, say a Heisenberg coupling between neighboring spins and maybe some other more complicated terms. And let's also assume that the Hamiltonian preserves spin rotation symmetry, you know, SU2 rotation symmetry, and also uh, whatever the, uh, space group of the underlying lattice system. Okay, so let's assume that. And the question is to understand what kind of phases of matter uh, can arise, can emerge from this Hamiltonian, from this type of Hamiltonian. So of course, a very common uh, option is uh, anti-fragmentally ordered state, a new order or some other order, or some other magnetic order, which breaks a spin rotation symmetry and usually also breaks ladder symmetry, ladder translation symmetry, for example. Uh, if we want to preserve spin rotation symmetry, then there's another possibility, which are commonly referred to as valence bond solids. So in this kind of states, in order to preserve the spin rotation symmetry, we want to, we want to have a singlet wave function. So we first pair the spins up into you know, a bunch of singlets. Uh, for example, here, these are uh, pairs of nearest neighbor spins forming uh, spin singlets, and these are called valence bonds. And then we arrange these valence bonds or spin singlets on lattice according to some pattern. And obviously, this, you know, this pairing and arrangement has to uh, have to break a translation symmetry. If you if you if we have a spin one half per unit cell. Okay, so then the question is: you No, know, are there other kinds of state that do not break uh, magnetic or do not break spin rotation symmetry uh, and the, the lattice symmetry. So such a possibility was envisioned by Phil Anderson in 1973. Uh, and I think he, he introduced this class of wave functions now known as a resonating valence bond. So this paper was largely forgotten until later uh, Anderson himself revived the idea in the context of uh, you know, high temperature superconductors. Okay, but let's, let me briefly describe this wave function. So the idea is that since we want to have a wave function that is, that preserves the spin rotation symmetry, while well, it's convenient to work in the basis of uh, valence bonds, since you already have a spin singlet to begin with. But any pairing of spins into singlets breaks the lattice symmetry. So to restore the lattice symmetry, let's just fluctuate these singlets and superpose them uh, in, the, in a single ground state wave function so that the lattice symmetry is preserved. Okay. And such a wave function is called a resonating valence bond state. So there are many different kinds of resonating uh, valence bond states. And the one that I will be focusing on for the moment is called the short range REB state meaning that only the nearest neighbor spins form singlets. And then we fluctuate these singlets in all the possible ways and write on a superposition of all of them as a, as a single wave function. You can see that this wave function uh, is highly entangled. And you know, the way that it's defined, it's designed to preserve both spin rotation and also lattice symmetry. 
So the property of this wave function uh, by now is well established. So for example, uh, it's shown, I think it's main, mainly due to work of Mosna and Sandy uh, some 20 years ago that uh, this wave function contains only short range correlation. So if you measure any two point correlation function, you'll see exponential decay and with the correlation lens of order of lattice spacing. And by the way, this is uh, what I'm talking about is a wave function defined on triangular lattice. And because of the short range correlation, there's clearly no symmetry breaking of any kind. And the short correlation also means that this could be a ground state of some, um, of some Hamiltonian with a gap, some local Hamiltonian with a gap. Therefore, it represents a stable phase of matter. Okay. So parent Hamiltonians are written down, can be written down. Now, um, this state is actually much more interesting than just having no symmetry breaking. And it's ordered in a very subtle way. And now it's known as a intrinsic topological order. So a one sentence quick definition of what a, an intrinsic topological order means is that this state cannot be smoothly connected or deformed to a trivial paramagnet, meaning that suppose one can tune parameters of Hamiltonians slowly so that no, the ground state evolves adiabatically uh, with uh, tuning of the parameters, then you can never turn it into a trivial paramagnet without crossing a phase transition. Okay, but this definition is, particular, is probably not very informative uh, since it merely tells you what you can not do with a state, you cannot turn into product state. So it's, no, it's non-trivial, but no, what is really non-trivial about this? Uh, so a useful way to think about uh, this, this phase is to, to look at uh, low energy excitations above the ground state. Uh, that means we consider these low-lying quality particles. Uh, so the low energy excitations can be described in terms of weakly interacting quality particles. And it turns out that these quality particles have uh, very unusual properties, for example, anionic statistics, which I'm going to describe right now. So what I'm going to do is that I'll give a sort of a cartoon picture of you know, the wave functions for these excitations. Um, so this is just one snapshot, snapshot of this huge wave function where we suppose all such uh, valence bonds configurations together. Okay. So since this is a state, this, this is a superposition of such, all such valence bonds, an obvious way to create excitations is to break one singlet bond and that liberates two spins, two spin one halves. Okay, so we can break it uh, and that, increase, that increases the spin quantum number of the ground state from zero to one. Uh, namely, we create a magnum. And what this shows is that a magnum is not really the most elementary excitation. It really splits into two uh, deconfined spin one half. Okay, so once we have these two spin one halves, because these valence bonds are fluctuating in the ground state, and then you can imagine moving these two guys apart uh, just by rearranging these bonds without breaking more bonds. So you don't have to pay any additional energy cost. You just have to rearrange these bonds and that doesn't cost much energy because it's already a highly fluctuating uh, superposition of these valence bonds. And therefore we say that these, uh, these spin one halves are deconfined particles and they are called spin nouns for obvious reasons. So uh, one magnum is equal to two spin nouns. All right, so there's another kind of excitation in a Z2 spin liquid. So, um, so to, describe this to, to describe this kind of excitation, we uh, need a little bit more words. Uh, so first, let's imagine we draw a path on the lattice that goes through the triangles. So uh, another way of putting it, but another way to say this is that this path goes through the dual lattice. And it also passes through some number of bonds. Okay. Now we write down a wave function, uh, which takes the following form. So we have two bisons. So this this wave function is the following. The, this wave function two bisons is a still a superposition of all the singlets. So you don't have to break any bonds. But now it's weighted by a sign. This sign is given by the even oddness of number of crossings. Basically, depend on how many 
bonds are crossed by this pass you draw. Okay. And you create two excitations at the end of this pass uh, by writing down such a wave function. Okay. And you know, the important thing to keep in mind uh, is that you know, these particles, they are defined by having this invisible string, invisible pass, you know, that secretly, secretly counting the number of singlets crossed, being crossed. Okay. So this is useful for, uh, at least for the next slide. Okay. And these are all the excitations you can create in this uh, state. And of course, you can also form a bound state of uh, a vice on a spin down. Okay, so I said that these particles have non-trivial breeding statistics, and you can actually see that quite uh, directly from these cartoon pictures. So, so let's consider a breeding statistics between this bison and a spin down. So you suppose I have a spin down sitting somewhere, and of course you cannot create just one, you have to create another one somewhere, and let's just imagine the other one is already uh, being dragged to somewhere very far, okay? And then imagine we move a vice on around this spin down. Okay. And to define the statistics, we have to compare this process, you know, what the result of this process with what happens if you simply move a spin down, a vice on around you know, the ground state uh, without anything enclosed. Okay. Now, uh, if you draw these pictures on a lattice, it becomes clear what happens. So in the first picture, uh, Mr. Chang, I'm, I'm sorry, but I think we had a question from Dr. Hooley. Sure, yeah. Yeah, sorry, if you don't mind my just asking briefly. So in the introduction of the visons, you had these two crosses and you had this path joining them. Yes. The, is the implication that the re-weighting is independent of the exact path that I take? Yes, between yes exactly. Two? That, right. That's a very good point I uh, forgot to mention. So uh, that's just the claim that this definition really gives you a two excitations at the ends of this pass means that it doesn't really matter how you draw the pass, uh, which in turn means if you draw a closed pass on the lattice in this way, uh, you know, how many numbers of bounds it cuts, of course, varies, but the parity is always fixed. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that's something one can easily check on the lattice. Great, thank you. Yeah. Right, that's a, that's a good point. Thanks for asking that. Okay, so, and that's exactly where I'm coming to, actually. So, um, so back to the braiding statistics. Well, remember that this Vison always carries a, this kind of string that's secretly counting the number of bounds that's being cut, uh, well, the parity of the bounds. And if we move a Vison around a spin down and then get rid of these Vison's, you know, annihilate them, uh, annihilate, annihilate this Vison with another Vison, then, it leaves behind it a pass that just counts number of uh, singlets. Okay. And here, for this particular choice of the pass surrounding one spin down, you see that it doesn't cut any bounds. So we, are not, uh, we don't expect to pick up any face uh, by this pass. However, in the ground state, if we do the same thing without this uh, spin down, meaning that you know, there are no bounds being broken, then we see that this pass, this particular pass, has to actually cross exactly one bound. Um, so the difference between these two is one, meaning that, meaning that the wave function will pick up a minus one in front of it. And that, that's the uh, origin of the braiding statistics. So you'll see a minus one if you move a bison around the spin down, just because of that string counting the number of bounds. Okay, so uh, you get a relative minus one phase factor. So I've uh, introduced these excitations and also their braiding statistics with a, a particularly simple wave function, but these properties hold more generally, and these are universal properties of this whole phase, and they can be kind of captured in a, a field theory kind of formalism, and the field theory turns out to be a, a gauge, sim, gauge theory. Okay. So this phase has an emergent gauge symmetry. So we have a bosonic spin down, which is half of a magnon, um, as I just explained, and I, I didn't mention, I didn't uh, go through this, but you can also show that this spin down is a boson. And then we also have a bison, which I call M, and uh, it has non-trivial breeding statistics with a spin down, and turns out that it carries a flux of an emergent Z2 gauge field, because the gauge group is, excuse me, 
the gate group is Z2, uh, the flux takes two values, zero, you can say zero pi, okay? And the Vison carries the pi flux of that Z2 gauge field. And then we can form a bound state of these two guys. And because of this minus one mutual braiding, it turns out that the bound state is actually a fermion, um, even though the underlying system is purely bosonic, it's just some bunch of spins, but you have an emergent fermionic particle, which is called a fermionic spin now. So the effective field theory of this uh, phase can be written down as some charge scalar. Okay, well, it has, also has to have carry a spin in the index that's associated with a spin ons uh, coupled to a Z2 gauge field. Okay, so this, this will be the field theory description of this phase of matter. Okay, so uh, I've discussed, I've discussed the in this intrinsic topology order, you know, namely the, what, what is the content of quality particles and what are their universal properties such as braiding. However, that's not the end of story. So in order to fully characterize this phase, we should also remind ourselves that Hamiltonian has some symmetries. And the symmetries are important, we love symmetries. And although this phase does not break any of those symmetries, you know, we, we are probably more used to, talk about, to, to talking about you know, the ground state breaking some symmetries, but this phase does not break any of the symmetries. However, that does not mean that um, symmetry is not, is doing, is completely <clears throat> absent in the story. There is actually a very interesting interplay between the symmetry and the topological order. Okay. And that should already, uh, no, <clears throat> that, that actually already showed up when we Call when we talk about a spin nonce, since a spin nonce carries spin one half, and spin one half is really a you know, property of the global spin rotation symmetry. Okay. And you might wonder, so why is it special to have a spin one half uh, a particle? Because you already have a spin one half lattice. Well, the, the proper way to uh, see this here is to compare the spin one half particle with what you can do by locally flip spins. So that's that's how you create local excitations. But, but just by flipping spins, all you can do is to create integer spin excitations, magnons, and you're never going to get a deconfined spin one half uh, particle, one half excitation. That has to come with a topological order like this one. Okay. So that is, uh, a, a, we can say that this means that the spin quantum number is fractionalized on these particles compared to local magnons local excitations you can create, okay? And the Vaisons, uh, since the wave function is written entirely in terms of the singlets, they don't have any spin, they're just spin zero particles. And these notions, of course, not new. Uh, no, back in the 80s, the first uh, example of topolog topological order phase, the quantum Hall effect, uh, we already know that there are quadrat particles and quadrat holes carrying a third charge third electron charge. This was pointed out in the first theory paper on uh, the fraction quantum Hall effect by Laughlin. And he realized that these quasi electrons and quasi holes are fractionally charged. Okay. Now, um, so spin and charge, these are internal symmetry quantum numbers. Now the let this Hamiltonian, this system also has lattice symmetries. So let me also discuss an example of kind of fractional quantum number of uh, lattice symmetry, and I call it fractional crystalline momentum. So lattice translations in this problem, well, on the lattice, they are generated by two unit translations. And on the triangular lattice, I'll just call uh, this one T1 and this one T2. These are the two bases of a Bravis lattice, okay? And let's imagine we have a Weisson sitting somewhere here. And let's also imagine a process where we move this Vison around one unit cell. Okay. So to move this Vison around one unit cell, well, one can first move it along the T1 direction, you know, one lattice spacing, and then followed by uh, moving it along the T2 direction, also one lattice spacing, and then going, the back, going backwards in T1, and then backwards in T2. Okay. So that, let me actually, uh, excuse me for one, one minute. So that means, so, so T1, T2 followed by T1 inverse, T2 inverse, 
takes a Vison around the unit cell. Okay. Now, again, remember that this Vison carries this string that's counting the number of bonds being crossed. So, and this pass exactly crosses one bond. I mean, the same picture that I showed you earlier uh, in, in talking about spreading statistics. Therefore, this sequence of moves, the T1, T2, T1 inverse, T2 inverse, actually gives you a minus one phase on the wave function. Okay. So that means T1 and T2, they actually anti-commute when you, when you act on the bison. Uh, what that means is that Vison really moves on the pi flux lattice. Although uh, in the Hamiltonian, there's no pi flux lattice. No, we just have a, an ordinary translation symmetry. It's not, no pi flux whatsoever, but the Vison's uh, effectively see the pi flux lattice. And that's possible because these Vison's, uh, they are not local excitations. They do not have to carry the same quantum number as the local, local particles. Okay. Okay, so uh, I've given you two examples of quality particles carrying a fraction of you know, quantum numbers of the underlying uh, degrees of freedom. For example, spin nouns can, uh, spin nouns have half integer spins, and the bisons uh, sees a pi flux that is a translation symmetry becomes magnetic uh, when, it, when it acts on the bisons. Okay, and this, means that you know, we should also consider these various ways that the quantum numbers of global symmetries become fractionalized on quality particles. And that implies there are multiple faces, there are distinct multiple faces, all having the same topological order. You know, if you look at the quality particles, they all have the same quality statistics with respect to each other, but then they carry different uh, patterns of symmetry fractionalization. And these are still distinct faces, uh, as long as we preserve that symmetry. If we preserve that symmetry, these faces are distinct. Okay. And this is a notion of symmetry enriched topological faces. Uh, they are already topological, they're already highly exotic, but now if, you, if we think about symmetries, there's, there are additional uh, distinctions between these faces enriched by uh, symmetries. Okay. Now for spin liquids, well, the symmetry that we want to consider usually is of course uh, the spin rotation symmetry SO3 and uh, I'll include time reversal symmetry and also the space group of the underlying lattice. Okay, so the natural question is, you know, can we classify all the possible Z2 spin liquids, say enriched by this symmetry? Okay, um, so can we come up with maybe a finite list, hopefully not very long list, and uh, un no, completely understand their properties so that whenever we see one, spin liquid either numerically or experimentally, we can just go and check which one it is. Okay. It turns out this question can actually be answered. And uh, we have to, to answer that, we actually we need to understand the possible ways that these uh, the crystalline symmetries are fractionalized. We have already talked about translation symmetry and also the spin rotation symmetry. So the translation symmetry can, uh, fractionalizing this particular way that the two generators of the translation symmetry become, say, anti-commuting uh, in the Z2 spin liquid when they act on one of these particles. And that's what I call the fractional crystal momentum. But now there are other uh, space group operations. So I'll use the Kagami lattice as the main example, and you can do similar things on other lattices. So on the Kagami lattice, the space group is generated by, of course, the translations, but also the point group, which can be uh, generated from the two reflections. They are both going through the center of this hexagonal plaquette, uh, but they are different reflection axes. Okay. And it turns out that there are three more relations. There are three kind of more invariants one has to worry about. One is the inversion square. So I of P means that this is the inversion respect to the center of this hexagonal plaquette. And this can be minus one or minus one when you do it on a, one of these particles. Okay. And then the reflection square can also be one or minus one. And similarly with uh, the other reflection, mu square. And you can, we can roughly think of these invariants as a fractional angular momentum, you know, this angular momentum on lattice. Now, since we have trans the time reversal symmetry, there are three more invariants. Uh, related to time reversal trans transformation. 
So one of them is T-square, and that just tells you whether a particle is a Cramer singlet or doublet. And there are two more that kind of combine the space and time uh, symmetries, so it's sigma T-square and mu T-square. And it turns out that you can actually show that this is a complete list. Once you know all these invariants, uh, nothing else you need to worry about uh, regarding the fractionalization of the crystalline symmetry. Okay, uh, so mathematically it's just, uh, for, for those who, who know this, this is the second cohomology of this symmetry group and you get eight invariants. I have seven here and the eighth one is just uh, half integer or integer representation of SO3. So you get eight indices in total. Okay, so uh, before I talk about classification, maybe the first thing we want to check is you know, what are these numbers for the short range RBB state, the prototypical state for uh, Z2 spin liquid? Well, you can go and compute these numbers. Uh, so I'm not going to go into details, I'm just going to list these invariants. So we already know that the E, the spin now has spin one half, that's how we define a spin now. The Vison has zero spin, and then it has minus one uh, from the commutator of translations. And then uh, it's all one for the rest of the list, uh, except the T square is minus one for the spin down because it's spin one half. So naturally it's also a Kramer doublet that propagates into the, the other two uh, invariants that has a T in it. Okay. Now, since we have this table, we can naively, no, one can probably just change all of these, any of these ones to minus one, and you're going to get a different kind of Z2 spin liquid. And that probably means that you put some signs into this wave function in some way. So maybe we can change one of these signs, okay? And since we have all these signs, let's even just fix a spin quantum number. Let's fix a spin quantum number one half and zero, but the remaining signs, it seems like one can just, one has a freedom to change all of them from one to minus one or vice versa. And that means naively you would get uh, something like two to the 14, this many different spin liquids just by putting some minus signs into the wave function. Okay, two to 14 because I have seven here for spin now and seven here for the bison. So uh, this was first uh, studied by Essen Hermley a uh, number of years ago. Okay, so this looks uh, awful a lot it almost mean that you know, there cannot be this many, there's just too many, suspiciously too, suspiciously too many. And uh, indeed, in the end of the day, there are not this many, and there are only eight out of this uh, you know, 16,000 that are actually physical. So, which means that we actually secretly made some mistake in you know, arbitrarily changing these signs. There are some rules that we haven't uh, specified. So in the end of the day, it turns out that you cannot do anything about this bison. So the bison, the quantum numbers are completely fixed. If we talk about the Z2 quantum spin liquid on a spin one half triangle lattice, okay. And for the E particle, for the spin noun, there are three signs you can change. So the sign uh, responsible for the, the, the magnetic translation symmetry, and then there's a sigma square, there's a mu square, and that's all, we cannot, we cannot do anything else. Uh, we cannot change any of the other signs. Okay. Uh, so this is really established in a series of papers, uh, maybe not complete list, and all of them can be constructed with, within a, a string or boson parton representation or using tensor network wave functions. So all of them exist, and these are all the states you can get if we think about Z2 quantum spin liquids on the spin one half triangle lattice. So it's a list of eight states, not too many. So that's kind of a little relief that we don't have to deal with 16,000 many states, we just have eight, really. Um, I should mention that this is actually not really a, a complete classification of C2 spin liquids. It's really just classification of the ways that symmetries can fractionalize. And this missing detail is that there are additional crystalline SPT symmetry protected topological phases, SPT indices, uh, that I haven't talked about, and I'm not going to uh, discuss these additional indices. Okay. All right, so I'll have one slide about what, no, how to go down from a list of 16 
thousand down to just eight. And what do I mean by anomaly free? So uh, it means that there are some 16,000 number of patterns of symmetry fractionalizations that are simply forbidden to occur on a two dimensional lattice. Okay. And it turns out that these forbidden fractionalization patterns can only exist on the surface of a, a three plus one bulk. And the bulk has to be non trivial, it's really a symmetry protective topological phase. Okay. Uh, so the bulk, the bottom line is that the bulk has to be somewhat a non-trivial state to support these anomalous or you know, forbidden symmetry rationalization patterns on the boundary. And this is made possible by the major progress in understanding these uh, anomalies in a topological phase, as well as uh, uh, a theory of you know, crystalline symmetry protective topological phases that were developed uh, quite recently. But uh, I won't say more about uh, the details of these calculations. Uh, this is, uh, I'm happy to talk about it offline. Okay, so, so we have a nice story about how the symmetries are fractionalized in the Z2 spin liquids. Uh, but you may wonder you know, whether any of these has, have ob observable consequences okay, when it comes to an actual spin liquid. Well, uh, so I'll discuss uh, the simplest fractionalization, the, the, probably the most uh, well understood one, that is a spin fractionalization. And this will be the second part of the talk. So before I continue, I'd like to just pause and see whether there are questions regarding uh, the first part of the talk. Okay, so uh, I'll just, Carry on. So um, when we talk about when we, when we think about spin fractionalization or similarly fractionalization of some internal symmetry like a charge, well, one obvious thing that comes to mind is that maybe it will show up uh, somewhere in the ch charge transport measurement. Okay. And of course, uh, we know this uh, story of fraction quant Paul effect, where uh, quantized Hall conductance or is uh, a robust signature for, for a fractional charge, okay? So oh, I'm sure everyone has seen this uh, Hall resistance fig pic uh, figure many times. And uh, in such a two deck, we have quantized Hall conductance, sigma xy equals to nu times e square over h. This is conductance unit. And for integer quantum Hall states, this mu takes integer values. And for fractional quantum power states, you have uh, fractional values, say one third, one fifth, or two fifths, two thirds, et cetera. Okay. So these are fractionalized compared to their values in the integer states. And through Laughlin's argument, we know that the quantized Hall conductance basically implies there must exist uh, excitations, qualified excitations carrying fractional charge equal to the Hall conductance. But to have a quantized Hall effect, well, you have to have time reversal symmetry breaking. And that also implies that the edge states are, you know, they have gapless edge states. So there are other ways to establish fractional charge in quantum power systems. For example, you can go and measure the quantum short noise on the gapless edge. That's another way to uh, probe uh, fractional charge in quantum power systems. But no, as I, as, as we just mentioned, uh, all, these, all these, these two measurements, these two measurements, Hall conductance and also short noise on edge, rely on first T-breaking so that you can have Hall's response and also a gapless edge states, okay? However, there are many topological phases that neither breaks time reversal symmetry nor have gapless edges. And Z2 spin liquids you know, perfectly escapes you know, these, these, these known methods of uh, uh, measuring fractional charge through transport. Okay, it's a spin liquid preserve time row symmetry, and you can actually show that they have primly gapped edges in general. So neither of these methods work in this case, okay? and we have to think a little bit harder to fig to uh, to see how to to detect fractional charge in the transport measurement. Okay, so naively deep in uh, deep inside a Z two spin liquid, 
it's an insulating state. Well, uh, I'm kind of mixing the language of spin and charge, and I'll clarify it in a minute. So it's an insulating state. There's a gap to all excitations. And because of time reversal invariance, there's no Hall response deep inside this space. So it seems like it's hopeless to see anything interesting uh, when we are deep inside this phase in terms of charge transport. Okay. So to kind of have any interesting signature, you know, maybe we should bring the system close to a phase transition where we have more quantum fluctuations so to amplify some of these signals. Okay. And then the question becomes, does this fractionalization of say the spin symmetry leave fingerprint in a critical transport? So of course, if we want to measure spin fractionalization, we have to measure spin transport, maybe using some uh, ideas from spin tronics, et cetera. Okay, so uh, since we are more used to, talk, to talking about uh, transport in terms of charge, so I'll use an equivalent representation of the same problem. So instead of spin one half, I'll discuss hardcore bosons. And this mapping is fairly standard so let's just write downspin as zero occup occupation of the hardcore boson and upspin as uh, one boson. Okay. And it's hard horror, so these are the two uh, occupation numbers allowed. Then you, know, you can have a dictionary between whatever you have on the spin side and then on the charge side. For example, uh, spin rotation symmetry around the z-axis, okay, so these are up and down in z-basis, the so spin rotation symmetry in the z x, uh, in, around the z-axis becomes simply the charge conservation symmetry. And the quantum spin liquid becomes a topological mod insulator. It's insulating state. Uh, and so it's a mod insulator. It doesn't break any symmetry, but it's topological. So let's just uh, call it topological mod insulator. And then uh, XY ferromagnet, in that you break spin rotation, you have an in plane ferromagnetic order translates into a superfluid. Okay. Then the spin ounce, which carries spin one half, now is a particle carrying half charge. Okay. Then the kind of transition that uh, I'd like to think about is the transition between this Z2 spin liquid or a topological mod insulator to a superfluid by tuning some parameter. Okay, so let me now actually uh, give a concrete model system where this transition is actually uh, realized. Okay, so here's a Hamiltonian. This Hamiltonian was, uh, a, well, a similar Hamiltonian was written down by Blantz, Fisher, and Gerben uh, earlier, in two, early 2000. And this is a slight variation of a Hamiltonian. Okay, so the Hamiltonian is a, is, consists of two kinds of terms. So the first term is just the hopping of hardcore bosons on the Kagami lattice. So we have Kagami lattice where the bosons occupy the sites, and then we just have nearest neighbor hoppings between sites. These Bs, B dagger creates a boson on site I. It is just the usual hopping term. And then we have an interaction term between and density density interaction term. And then here in this figure, so all these lines, I hope you can see these lines, these lines represent which sites are involved in this density interaction, okay? So it involves, say, the nearest neighbor interaction and the next nearest neighbor, and also uh, these pair of sites, uh, which are inversion respect to each other, respect to the center of the package. Okay. Then we also have a cap potential term to tune the fitting. Okay. So I'll assume that both T and this V are positive. So all of all these interactions have exactly the same strengths, and this is designed to have a spin liquid ground state. So this is a repulsive interaction. And we'll be working with half fitting. So I'll fix a fitting to one half, which means in the spin language, we have zero total magnetization. Therefore, there's a O2 spin uh, symmetry. Don't have SO3, but we have O2 spin rotation symmetry. Now, when the hopping amplitude is much smaller than the interaction, then we can you know, work uh, in the basis where the interactions are already minimized and do some kind of uh, degenerate perturbation theory. 
And that maps a model to a quantum dimer model on a triangular lattice, which uh, has exact solution. So this was what's done in the paper by Balance, Fisher, and Gervin. They established that in that limit, there is a Z2 spin liquid or Z2 topological melt insulator uh, in such a model. Okay. However, when T is increased, well, you, cannot, no, you can no longer solve this model exactly and it has to resolve to numerics. And what's nice about this model is that they can be, it can be simulated very efficiently using a quantum and Carlo simulation okay, because there is no sign problem uh, in this model. So, so this is a phase diagram as one tune the ratio between T and V. And from now on, I'll measure everything in terms of V. So the energy unit will be set to one. V is, it will be set to V equals one. Um, so as you crank up the hopping amplitude, that obviously increased, increases the kinetic energy of the bosons, therefore induces a transition to a simple fluid. So, uh, and that actually happens for relatively small value of hopping amplitude around 0.07. Then there is a quantum critical point between this topological order, the model insulator, and the superfluid. So although we'll be focusing on this half fitting case, I'd like to just show a, a global phase diagram where we tune both uh, the fitting and also the hopping amplitude. And this is the phase diagram you get if you vary both of them. This looks like you know, the standard phase diagram of uh, both Hubbard model, where you have these lobes of incompressible states, then the rest of the phase diagram is occupied by the superfluid. You see that we have a Z2 spin liquid here. Then if you go away from half fitting, uh, mu is five because of the way that we write interaction, but this is really half fitting. And then if you go to a third fitting, you get uh, a different kind of, uh, you get a, a lattice symmetry breaking state, and then you go to one six fittings, a different kind of uh, lattice symmetry breaking. And the transition that we talk about cuts through this tip of the lobe. Okay, so, uh, but, yeah, sure. Uh, is there any reason why this space diagram should look like the boss hapner model? Well, um, I don't, no, I'm not sure there's like a, a pretty good reason to, a priori reason that this space diagram has to look like the boss hapner model, uh, but that's quite natural and that's just what's established in numerics. Okay. And also, of course, when V is, when T is very small, interactions dominate uh, over the kinetic energy. So you know, that usually favors some kind of charge density wave states or some kind of uh, lattice symmetry breaking state. So you can expect that there's a region where you have these uh, lattice symmetry breaking states, incompressible state, and then superfluid. Okay. okay, thanks. Okay, so the superfluid, let me just uh, make one comment about superfluid. It's a usual superfluid. There's nothing exotic about this superfluid. It's a conventional Bose Einstein condensation where, say, V acquires expectation value. So, usually, a mod insulator to superfluid transition belongs to the 3D XY universality class. Um, it's also known as an O2 Wilson Fisher fixed point because of the O2 symmetry that we have at the tip. But uh, here, it's a bit different because the insulating side is topologically ordered. So it cannot just be the usual 3D XY. Uh, it's really XY star, okay? Star just means that you have to remember there are these emergent gauge fields, there's a fractionalization going on um, at this insulating side. Okay. Um, so therefore, this quantum critical point is an unusual one. It's an unconventional critical point with emergent Z2 gauge field. Z2 gauge field still plays a role at the critical point. And that, that's, a, that's an important message. So um, one manif manifestation of this, uh, this unusual quantum critical point is that all the parameter acquires a large anomalous dimension. Okay, so anomalous dimension so if you measure the correlation function of all the parameter, it decays at the uh, power law with exponent one plus epsilon, uh, one plus eta, eta is an anomalous dimension. It's usually very small for xy because it's perturbatively connected to a free theory, but it's significantly enhanced at this xy star critical point. 
uh, I forgot to put a reference to this stuff. Um, I think the first example of this was discussed uh, in the context of uh, SO3 spin system. So that's, that's like O4 star. So anyway, so um, but now let's think about conductivity at a critical point. Okay. So um, conductivity, well, we can just measure it. We can just compute the conductivity using Kuber's formula. So it's basically given by the current current correlation function. And I'll, I'll be working with Matsubara frequency because this is the most convenient thing to do in Monte Carlo simulations. And the current operator on the lattice is just defined in the you know, most standard way. Okay? It just gives you, it's just given by the hopping of the bosons. And let me just emphasize that here, uh, B dagger creates a boson of charge Q equals one. So that's a unit charge carried by a physical boson. Okay. And we can define a quantum conductance unit, which is Q squared over H. Okay. And if we work with a unit, system where h bar is set to one, as we always do, and this is just one over two pi. All right, so conductive, conductivity at two plus one critical point has some nice properties. Okay, first, because of scale invariance, uh, this is a z equals one critical point. So sigma as a function of uh, frequency and also temperature takes the following form. So of course we have this conductance unit and then it's multiplied by a universal scaling function, which is just omega over temperature. And that, that follows from z equals one. Um, and this function is universal, it's dimensionless. So, so it's, it's really encoding a lot of information about this critical point, okay. And as t goes to zero, and where we hold the old frequency fixed and take t to zero, uh, meaning that argument of this function's divergent, then this function has to go to a constant. Okay. So that's what happens at a critical point. So in other words, let's just have a kind of a, a schematic phase diagram of this system uh, also with temperature axis. So uh, this is a critical point between the mod insulator and uh, the superfluid. And we are, in, we are working in this critical fan where critical, quantum fluid critical fluctuations dominate the low energy physics. Okay. And we are going to approach a critical point you know, right at this value of T over V by just decreasing the temperature. Okay. And let me first show you the data. Okay. So this is the Monte Carlo the data from Monte Carlo simulation of this model. Uh, and here it should really be sigma over the uh, conductance unit sigma over sigma q uh, and the, the x-axis the x-axis here is frequency you know, in units of two pi times t so just the integers and this is uh, well the other axis is conductance uh, in units of the uh, quantum conductance unit okay so i should uh really uh emphasize that this is a lot of in numerical work going to this figure, each of these, each of these point represents uh, a, a result of finite scaling you through all these different system size. And then the, we are doing a two step extrapolation to really get to the thermodynamic limit properly. So we first look at finite size scaling. So all these are measured on the finite size system with L by L, uh, number of unit cells, there are number of sites. And then we take different measurements at different temperature, the one over T temperature beta, and then extrapolate to the thermodynamic limit or the zero temperature limit. Okay. So you can see that we have to go to rather large values of uh, beta in order to really have access to the critical regime. Okay. So uh, we can just focus on this red line here, which is the uh, data that uh, extrapolated from the finite size uh, calculations to some of them limit and zero temperature. Okay. And this curve, as you can see, if we go to very large value of frequency, it's approaching a constant. You see a clear plateau in this region. 
And of course, eventually, if you go to very, very large frequency, you just go down as one over omega square. But this existence of plateau should be quite clear from this figure. And just remind you that you know, we work with energy unit V equals one in throughout, this, uh, throughout this talk. Okay, so, um, and then of course, the, I should mention that the value, the important thing here is uh, the plateau value of the conductance, which is roughly 0 0.1, 0 0.098. All right. Okay, so to understand the, no, the implication of this result, well, uh, we should look at what happens at XY transition. And this was, uh, this was looked, very, looked at very carefully by Will William, uh, Eric Sorensen, and Subir Sachdiv uh, a few years back. So, and here is a similar plot for the standard XY transition done on a quantum rotor model, it's just like the most you know, uh, straightforward rotor model you can write down, which realizes XY transition, 3D XY transition. Okay. So in this rotor model, um, you can see that the conductance, and again, this is measured at a critical point. You can see that there is a similar shape of the curve, but now they already uh, get to in this get get into the shape of you no know, just monotonically decreasing without going into very large beta okay as compared to the model of the result of the bfg model where you see like there's uh the for small values of beta actually it's has some kind of non-monotonic shape and only when we go to very large value of beta uh we see this nice you know, decay, decaying shape of the function and that's not difficult to understand because we have a lot of frustrations in this model um, as compared to the much nicer model, quantum rotor model. So we have to work a lot harder to access really, uh, this, really the critical transport. Okay, and the universal conductance at XY critical point was also measured in the same paper. Okay, and the value turns out to be zero point uh, about just point uh, three six, okay. And they actually looked at two different realizations of the x y critical point. Uh, one is quantum rotor model. The other is a classical Berlin sort of model that both uh, have this x y universality class uh, realized. But they and you see that exactly the same curve almost on top of each other uh, were observed numerically. Okay. So the existence of this uh, universal conductance in a two plus one critical point was, I believe, first pointed out by this paper in 1990s, this uh, famous paper, but it takes some 20 years to really observe this uh, numerically. And uh, I should mention that you know, the recent advance in a different method, numerical method, the conform bootstrap, gives uh, a more pre precise value of this conductance, which is zero, three, oh, with four digits, three, five, five, four. Okay. This was from the paper last year. Okay, so now we have these two numbers, one for the XY star critical point, and that's zero, oh, nine, and the other one is, uh, is a value at the XY. Now, um, if we compare them, if we just look at the ratio, well, it's 0 .0 0 0.27, okay? And that's very close to 0 0.25, which is a quarter, okay? So the first thing that the transport is somewhat suppressed, the conductivity is somewhat suppressed in XY star compared to XY because of all these frustrations going on. But this suppression, this one quarter suppression, uh, it's very suggestive, meaning that while well, it's just square of one half, and we know that the XY star, this C2 spin liquid, has half charge. It supports quadriparticles which carry half charge. So one most natural explanation is that simply the charge carriers are now these uh, fractionalized spin nuns. Okay, these uh, these half charge particles are carrying the current. Therefore, you see uh, you see a suppressed conductance just because these particles carry spin one half, 
and therefore spin fractionalization uh, leads to this uh, fractional, fractional quantized conductance at the, at the critical point. So uh, this intuition can be drawn out by a little more careful field theory analysis and things I'm, it's already three, so I'll just go through this, I'll just flesh out this quickly. So uh, this transition is driven by the condensation of spin knots. Okay. These guys undergo a both and Einstein trans, uh, condensation. And as a fact, we know that there's emergent Lorentz symmetry and also O2 global symmetry in this model. So just, we can just write down the simplest possible field theory that describes condensation of spin knots where phi is a complex scalar associated with a spin knot. And this is just a usual phi to the fourth theory for a complex scalar. Okay. And here, R is a parameter that we tune to drive the transition. But no, this theory looks just like the standard phi to the fourth, but we have to remember that a physical boson, Q equals one, uh, boson is really a pair of spin knots. And so it's really phi square is a physical boson. Phi itself, is not really a physical observable. So therefore, H, although it looks same as O2 Wilson-Fisher uh, theory, but there's a hidden Z2 gauge structure. So it's hard to write down a Z2 gauge theory in a continuum, but since this is a discrete gauge field, uh, it's largely static, at least well below the gap of the bison, which tells you the gap to Z2, Z2 gauge fluctuations, and that's roughly T squared over V, okay, which is quite small in this problem, and that's why we have to work very hard to go to very low temperature in order to really have a kind of a window where it's really a conformal field theory. Otherwise, you know, all these Bison fluctuations are still, will be kind of uh, messing up with uh, the critical transport. So the Z2 gauge fluctuations are not dynamical in this regime. And the only effect is to enforce a Gauss law, therefore changing the operator content. So shortly, just in one sentence, the physical op operators must be gauge invariant. And the gauge transformations simply put a, putting a minus sign in front of phi. Therefore, the operators that are physical must be invariant under phi goes to minus phi. For example, you can write phi square or phi to the uh, force, et cetera. But for example, phi itself is not gauging rent. And in order to access transport, well, we have to define the current operator. And in the Wilson Fisher theory, that just looks like phi times the well, gradient of phi star, that's a standard current operator. However, we have to include this one half in front because now uh, the phi square is a physical boson carrying charge one. So we have to introduce this one half to normalize it properly. Uh, so that the physical boson has indeed charge one. Okay. Then if you simply stick this into the definition of Hall conductance, well, not Hall conductance, but longitudinal conductance, you get one quarter in front. Okay. So that explains the uh, fractional conductance and as a direct consequence of a charge fractionalization at the critical point. Okay, so there are many questions to be addressed for this particular problem, um, but since I'm already running out of time, uh, I'll just put up these summary slides and uh, thank you all for your attention. Okay, so I guess I can stop, I can get out of this now. Yeah, so if anybody has any questions, they can either raise their hand or they can um, unmute themselves and just ask. Yes. Theory for the non monotonic behavior of the conductivity as a function of frequency for the fractionalized model? Oh, uh, you mean what causes that non monotonic behavior? Yes. I mean, you have uh, a yeah, some, so some simple theory that could give that. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a good understanding of that part. I mean, uh, the, the obvious reason, ob obvious thing to blame is that there are these bisons. That right, are, right, that's what I was hoping for. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, right, so, I mean, there's actually, no, we, I, I didn't, think uh, Subir <laughs> is asking this question. I didn't talk about uh, these additional corrections to the universal conductance, there are these, corrections at large frequency that can be 
systematically characterized uh, in compound field theory, and our measurements uh, simply did not agree with theory for that part. And again, we blame for these low-lying bison excitations, uh, which although they got charge neutral, they could change uh, the density of states. And you know, after mm -hmm. you do some convolution that change various things, I find the temperature measurement. But I don't have more to say about the non-montonic behavior. Okay, uh, Dr. Hooley. Hi. Yeah, hi again. Uh, so thanks for a very nice talk. Um, I wanted to ask whether I wanted to ask whether you could discuss whether the x y star critical point should be visible in the conformal bootstrap technique. Oh yes. So um, it should be visible. It should be visible. Although the thing that you no know, the conformal bootstrap. No, usually what you do is that you scan, say, uh, the skin dimensions of some operators and make a plot. You know, these are allowed regions, these are disallowed regions. But uh, for this particular transition, it's the scaling dimension of all the parameter has a large analysis correction. So to see that, you have to go very far in this plot. And <laughs> usually, you know, the bootstrap people did not go that far. However, it's actually fairly easy to describe it, this theory in, in the bootstrap framework, because it's really, you know, in, in a sense, it's really just x, y, but we have kind of chopped out some operators. We have just thrown out, say, uh, the charge one representation, the charge one, or the parameter of the usual x, y, and keep only the even charge operators in the theory. So in a sense, once you have you know, all the information about x, y, you have all the skin dimensions, all the OPE coefficients, you automatically have that, for how, have the same, uh, well, have information for X, Y star. You just need to truncate the theory down to a certain sector where you have even uh, charge representations, et cetera. And then you have to adjust this current operator appropriately to normalize everything um, uh, correctly, but that's it. So uh, I think they are, they are there in the compound bootstrap. Uh, you just have to look very far in the plot, uh, which was not usually done. But in, in the, on the other hand, you don't actually need to do this because the, you, know, you, you get this just from uh, the data of the XY. I see. Thank you. Uh, I mean, isn't the, the formal bootstrap essentially identical between XY and XY star? But it's really the uh, modular properties. If you put it on a finite system, yeah, well, and, uh, I mean, then, the, then the states have to be, uh, there has to be some surgery on the states, I think. Right, right, that, that's, uh, that's, that's uh, absolutely right. So in a sense, it's identical. It's just that you have to truncate a theory down to you know, a subset. Uh, but you need a finite system size for that to make a difference. I well, think. even, I mean, uh, if, no, in the, if, if we just look at operators, you know, what operators are there, physical operators are there, uh, it's a smaller set compared to X, Y. Right? Uh, well, I mean, uh, it's possible to measure, you know, spin on spin on correlation functions, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. I guess it requires, yeah, yeah they're non local. The Wilson line between them. Oh, so yeah, we, they're non local, right? Okay. Yeah, if you talk about local operators, then it's a smaller set. Right, right. Otherwise, it's identical. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Okay, any other questions? So maybe I'll wait five seconds if anybody wants to um, unmute themselves, they can please feel free to ask any question. Okay, so let's thank Professor Ming Cheng for more time. Thank you.